you uh, for bringing your families to church today. Uh, being a good, good father is, uh, starts with leading your families well and being the spiritual head of the house. Amen. And so uh, a lot of guys like to do different things on Father's Day, we like to fish, uh, play golf, spend the whole day out by the grill, whatever the case may be. Um, but we all have different things we like to do, but I think when a dad shows his family that God's more important than any of the other stuff, I think that that is where being a dad really begins, amen? And uh, just like there's a difference between being a father and a dad, or a, a mother and a mom, there's a difference between being a father and a dad. And we don't need fathers, we need daddies to gather up their children and their families and, uh, and to lead well, Amen? So uh, I have an assignment from God today, and I pray that this hits home for all of us. Um, So let's go to the gospel according to Luke. The gospel according to Luke, chapter 15. Chapter 15. It is my desire today to paint the picture for you to be able to see where God is in waiting for you today. Luke chapter 15, and if you'll forgive me. Good news is, I got some new glasses coming, praise be to God. And, uh, you know, I mean, I've reached, uh, I, I asked the, what do you call them? Optometrist, is that right? I don't know all the words. Uh, the eye doctor, thank you. We, can, we say it like Alabama, the eye doctor over there. Uh, but uh, I asked the eye doctor, I'm like, you know, why is it I, 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 I can see through my glasses to drive, but can't see through my glasses to read? And she said, um, well, you are 45. And uh, it started giving me kind of a negative, like, okay, you're not, I'm, not, I'm not a fan of you right now. And then she tested my eyes, and she goes, oh, well, I can't explain this. I said, what can't you explain? She said, at your age, we should be increasing the strength of your prescription, but we've actually got to decrease it by two steps because your eyes are better now than they were three years ago when you got these glasses. Amen. Amen. And... Uh, and she said, and that doesn't make sense. I said, well, I completely understand it. And, uh, and so the reason why I can't see is because it's too strong and it blurries everything. So if you all would just be patient with me while I take my glasses off to read. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. Okay. Uh, Luke chapter 15 and verse number 11. If you have it, say amen. amen. Then he said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that falls to me. So he divided his estate between them, say them. Most people don't understand. They just think that the one son took what belonged to him while the other son was helpless. Both of them got equal share. Are you here? Verse number 13, not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together, journeyed to a distant country. And there he squandered his possessions in prodigal living. When he had spent everything, there came a severe famine in the country. Gas prices increased. I'm sorry. The- <laughs> there came a severe famine in the country, and he began to be in want or to be in lack. So he went and hired himself to a citizen of that country who sent him into the field to feed the hogs. He would gladly, listen to this, have filled his stomach with the husks that the swine were eating, but nobody gave him any. Then he came to himself. And said, how many of my father's hired servants have an abundance of bread? And here I am perishing with hunger. I will arise and go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Hire me. Make me an employee. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he arose and he came to his father. Watch this. But while he was yet far away, his father saw him 
and was moved with compassion and ran and embraced his neck and kissed his son. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned before heaven and you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bring here, now this is my kind of dad right here. Bring here the fatted calf, not the skinny one. Y'all ain't here. Bring here the fat cow. That's what it says, right? And kill it. Yes, sir. And take it over to Central Missouri Meat and Sausage. That's what it says. Kill it and let us eat and be merry. When daddy saw son, he said, put a robe on him, put a ring on him, get some shoes on his feet. We about to have a brisket dinner. That's what your Bible says. You can't just read the Bible. You got to read what's not written. Okay? Let's eat and be merry, for this son of mine who was dead is alive. He that was lost is found. So they began to be merry. They celebrated. Today, I want to talk to you about the subject, welcome home. Welcome home. It's Father's Day, and I would be remiss if I didn't remind us all that God is our Father. And when I say something like God is our Father, I said it yesterday to the group of men and their families as at our uh, father and son luncheon yesterday, and uh, what a wonderful time we had, amen? What a great time to be together. And um, as we were filling our bellies with burgers and brats and dogs and all the sides and fixings and desserts. We just got to thinking about that. And, you know, maybe for some of us that are here this morning, that were here yesterday, when you hear a statement that God is your father, maybe it might not have a positive connotation to it. And the challenge that we as dads have is our prime prime responsibility is not just to love our families and lead our families, but to actually form and fashion their mindset of God based on our relationship with them. Because how can we say that God is a father if we don't give them a good point of reference to being a good father some of us didn't have good fathers some of us had bad fathers some of us had absent fathers and some of us don't know our fathers but I have to tell you that regardless of your earthly experience God will be a father to you in a way that another man never could be amen neither ladies is it your job to be dad we need moms to be moms and dads to be dads So when I say God is your father, I'm saying that's a good thing. He'll love you when nobody else will. He'll protect you when nobody else will. He provides for you when nobody else will. Amen? God is our father. And because he's our father, he does not see us. Listen to me. He does not see us through the eyes of what you've done. He sees us through the eyes of our relationship. When I look at my boys and my daughter, I don't see them based upon what they do or have not done. I look at them through the relationship that they are my seed. Amen. A real father will not treat you according to your behaviors. He will treat you according to your relationship, but then coaching and disciplining the behaviors. Are you with me? He is a good, good father father somebody say amen the bible tells us in luke chapter 15 about the story of a man we are not given the man's name because it's really not important to the story but the bible says that a man had two sons how many sons i can understand how this man must have felt having two sons of my own the man had two sons and we hear about the one son who came to his father and said father give me what belongs to me and I need you to understand this because this passage has been mispreached for many years for different, different agendas. And I, so I need to bring some balance here and need you to understand that his error was not in asking for what belonged to him. His error was not saying, Father, give me my portion. Because he understood something that many of the church does not understand. 
And that is the reality, is that being a son means having an inheritance. The heir was not in asking for what belonged to him. The heir is what he did with what belonged to him. And the Bible says that the dad said, okay, fine. And he divided all of his possessions and he equally gave to the one and to the other. You read the story as it, as it continues and the other brother got angry because they celebrated the brother who was lost but then came home and, and they followed him and said, but, it, but what are you talking about? Oh, we could have killed a calf for you anytime, but you never asked for it. We could have thrown a party for you anytime, but you never asked for it. And now you're angry at your brother because he dared to ask for what belonged to him. You need to know that being a son or being a daughter in the kingdom of God means you have access to an inheritance. What belongs to the father belongs to the son. Uh, somebody blessed me with a custom-made smoker. And my wife looked at me because typically I'll have a grill and then I use it and abuse it and then sell it to upgrade to the next best thing. And when she looked at this and she said, you know, this is really, a cu- this is really, really nice. She's like, how long is this one going to last? I said, this is an inheritance smoker. She said, what do you mean? I said, I mean, I'm going to use it. I'm going to make sure that it, it is well taken care of. And then if one of my sons wants it when they get married and they move on and they become a dad or whatever the situation is, it's an inheritance smoker to be something I give to my sons. And every time they cook on it, they'll remember this was dad's. Being a father means if you're a son, what you have belongs to him. And I'm here to tell you that you have an inheritance in the kingdom of God. What belongs to the father belongs to the sons and to the daughters. Somebody say amen. The error of this son was what he did with what belonged to him. It was not an asking for it is how he chose. And it said not many days afterwards. In other words, he only asked for what belonged to him because he had plans. He knew what he wanted and he took it. But then the Bible says that he squandered it all away. Some people, yeah, I really feel that maybe this generation would benefit more from real life math than they benefit from algebra two. Because we have a generation, trust me, I've hired them and trained them myself. There's a generation who doesn't know how to understand how to balance a checkbook. They don't understand budgeting. If they're poor making $20,000 a year, they would also be poor making $20 million a year. The issue isn't the money. The issue is the inability to budget. Some of y'all ain't going to say amen because that hurt a little bit, didn't it? But listen to what I'm saying. He squandered it all away because he was irresponsible. He wasted it all away. The word prodigal, the Bible says he spent it on prodigal living. The word prodigal means wasted or to spend extravagantly. You know, it's like the person that says, I'm believing God to give me a Lexus. And they don't even have insurance on their Pinto. I can't get, I can't get no, no help. Like you sitting there wanting a Corvette. And you're having a hard time to afford a payment on a Chevy Aveo. You can use that in your sales pitch. You're welcome. (laughs) You understand what I'm saying? It's to spend extravagantly, to waste it, to squander it. And that's what this son did. That was what it means in prodigal living. It was not just that he was living a sinful life. He was living a wasteful life. Are you with me? So he spent all that he had because he was absorbed with himself. He was full of pride in everything that's associated with it. It's my inheritance. I'll do with it whatever I want is what he said. Prodigal living is found when we consume and blame. Now I promise you we're not talking politics today. But when you are a prodigal, you consume because you're filled with yourself And then you begin to blame others for what you now do not have. You consume because it's all about you. And then you blame because it's everybody else's fault. To be a prodigal just simply says, I'm going to do whatever I want. It's about me. We are living in a society that fosters prodigal living. 
We hear from social media. If it feels good, it must be right. We hear from local news outlets. Don't let somebody else tell you what's right and wrong. Live for yourself. But prodigals do exactly that. They live for themselves. They do what they want. And they are masters at shifting the fault. It could not have possibly have been his own fault that he was now homeless, moneyless, living with hogs. Living with hogs ain't a bad thing if you own your own barbecue company. Y'all know what I'm saying? But this is not who he was. He was somebody that took no responsibility. Being a prodigal doesn't take responsibility for their own errors. I've often found that a prodigal living person and a narcissist are often the same person. Because they will not take responsibility for the choices they've made. They blame everybody else for what lies on their shoulders. Being a prodigal simply says, well, this has all gone wrong. Got to be the devil's fault. I've seen Christians who are prodigals because everything goes upside down in their life and it was the devil's fault. They take no responsibility but think they can change their life by rebuking. Before you rebuke the devil, you need to repent for your own decisions. Boy, mm. It's so much easier to blame somebody than to take responsibility. Right? You get pulled over by the trooper. And instead of taking responsibility for going 12 over, we blame the state trooper for just trying to fill his quota. Right, Sam? you got to take responsibility. Maybe it isn't somebody else's fault. Maybe, as Michael Jackson said, it's the man in the mirror. Sorry. You're welcome. Just got to lighten up, y'all, because it's heavy. Maybe... The Bible says the, the word is a mirror that shows a man what manner of person he is. And you got to take responsibility. Responsibility. Maybe we need to stop blaming the debt collectors and we should take responsibility for the debt. Boy, but <laughs> All right, I'm going to move on because some of y'all are squirming. You're getting a little uncomfortable. But do you understand what I'm saying? You know you're a prodigal if you cannot take responsibility and every, everybody else is to blame for where you're in. Maybe you've run away from God because it's the church's fault. Maybe you're running away from God because it was the pastor's fault. He didn't even shake my hand. I didn't get nothing out of this service. Why did I even waste my time coming to church? And we never stopped to think about, well, if I didn't get anything out of this service, what did I actually put into the service? Do you understand what I'm saying? prodigals will always look to blame somebody else for what lies on their own shoulders prodigal living the bible says he spent it all we don't know what kind of length of time this was but he spent everything that he had he went from being a prince to being a pauper he went from living in a surplus to living in lack he suffered hunger and the bible says he had no place to rest And the Bible says he even would have eaten the pig slop, but nobody would give him any. Can you imagine going from being provided for to being absolutely rejected, ostracized, and put off? And now the Bible says he found himself living with the pigs. Probably in a barn somewhere, using a bale of hay for a pillow. Hanging out with the pigs. Now he looks like the pigs. Smells like the pigs. Behaving like the pigs. Because whatever you're surrounded by, you become. Whatever you get involved with, whatever you invest in, becomes a part of you. You can invest in the church And you can become the best version of yourself. You can invest in the world and become the worst version of the world. 
you become what you are surrounded by. But then the Bible says that while he's there, nobody give him any food, nobody give him a place to rest, he has no money, he's suffering from hunger, and he's laying amongst the pigs, and the Bible says, but then he came to himself. It's the aha moment. He came to himself. I, I'll say it this way. I can see him maybe in a barn surrounded by hogs and filthy. Hasn't, doesn't have a place to shower. Doesn't have a clean change of clothes. And I can see him coming to himself. If it was in today's vernacular, or excuse me, if it was in 90's vernacular, he might have said, hold up, wait a minute. What am I doing? What on earth am I doing? There must come a time when you come to yourself and you have got to stop blaming somebody else and you've got to wake up and remember who you are. You've got to come to the place that the prodigal came to where he said, Hold, what, 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 what am I doing here? If I, if I went home, I'm thinking about all my daddy's employees. Everybody's got a place to rest. Everybody's got clean clothes. Everybody has a place to bathe. Everybody's got fresh bread. Come on, somebody. Everybody's got what they're provided for. And they're in the safety and the protection of my father. What am I doing here? There comes a time when you're a prodigal where you must make a decision. You can stay in what you're in and blame everybody else, or you can come to yourself and say, it'd be better if I just come home even if I'm not received as a son, it's better for me to go home. To go home. So he says, what am I doing here? It's better to be a servant. I'd rather go home and tend the barns for my father, but have a clean place to go and bathe myself with clean clothes than it is to stay here living with these hogs. At least I could be near my father. Even if he won't call me son, I could at least be near my father. Even if he won't forgive me, he may hire me. And that's got to be better than this. There must be a time in your life where you come to yourself and say it's time to go home. It's time to go back to God. It is time to go to my father. And even if there's a chance he won't receive me, will he at least put up with me? And it would be better for me to be God's servant, even if I'll never become God's son. I could at least be near my father. So the Bible says that he went home. He made the decision, I'm getting up out of this. I'm going home. And so he treks his way. And you need to understand something that the Bible says, even though you can't read it, the Bible still paints the picture of it. He left, if you will, the hog pit. And he just started walking home. He didn't shower. He just started walking home. He didn't. Go to the super Walmart and buy some George jeans. He just started walking home. He didn't go to a consignment shop and get a new used pair of shoes. He just started walking home. The Bible says, that while he was still a long ways off, his father saw him. While he was covered in mud, his father saw him. And you can read that and think it's a beautiful picture that his father saw him, but this is what I see in it. His father saw him because his father was looking. Day after day after day, when that prodigal was wasting his life, his father was looking for him. When he squandered his inheritance, his dad was still looking for him. 
when he was living amongst the hogs in the most vilest situations, but still, his dad was not in the comfort of his chambers. His dad, I could see it, coming out every morning onto the front porch. Is he alive or is he dead? I don't even care what he smells like. I want him to come home. I don't care what he's done with my inheritance. He's got to come home. And the Bible says that he saw his son. And he did not stay in the point of judgment. All right, come home. The Bible says his father ran. His father ran in the field. And he went chasing after his son. And I don't care what you're in this morning. I don't care how you've sinned. I don't care what you're in. I don't care about the addiction. I don't care about the hardness of your heart. Your Father is not sitting in some back room forgetting about you. God the Father's on the front porch. Wondering if today's the day that you'll come home. And the Bible says that Father ran off into that field and He chased His Son down. Grabbed Him. I need you to see this. He grabbed him and he fell on his neck. And he kissed him. And the son looked and said, Dad, I'm sorry. I've wasted my life. I've wasted your inheritance. I've sinned against God and I've sinned against you and my family. And I'm no longer worthy to be your son. And the father wrapped his arms around him and said, let's go home. Let's just go home. Brings his son into the house. And then the dad said, bring me a robe. The finest robe. Don't, don't bring me that Kmart blue plate special. Y'all know what I'm saying? Y'all remember Kmart? Huh? Bring me the finest robe. Bring me the kingly robe. And wrap it around me. Bring me a ring. Place it on his hand. I need you to run down to Capital City Mall. Go over to Hibbets. I need you to buy a new pair of Jordans for him. My son is home. Taking some creative license there. Put some shoes on his feet. And he said, go, go kill the cow. We're going to have a barbecue today. Because my son, who was dead, is alive. He that was lost has been found. Do you understand the power in that moment? But Pastor Tim, what does that have to do with me? The Bible says, for you have received a robe of righteousness. The crown of life. When his dad took him and wrapped a robe around his shoulders, he wasn't just saying, he's my son. But he was saying, I'm going to cover I'm going to cover everything you've been in. I'm going to take a robe and wrap it around your shoulders. And I know what you look like under there. But my servants won't know what you've been in. Your brother won't see what you've been in. I'm going to cover the, the marks and the lasting effect of your sin. And I'm going to cover you in my righteousness. I'm going to take a ring. And I'm going to slide it on your hand. Because not only am I going to cover your sin, but I'm going to let everybody know, you family. Your family. Because it was only the king and the prince who would wear the ring of the kingdom. Not only am I covering your sin, but I'm going to make sure everybody knows you're my son. And we're going to throw a party. Do you remember the day you came home to Jesus? Do you remember what it was like? 
some of us had pig slop on us. Some of us were dirty and smelly and stinky in our sin, but God wrapped us in a robe of righteousness. We know what's under the robe, but they don't know what's under this robe. When they look at us, they see righteousness, but we know inside of us there are marks, marks of degradation and sin. But God chooses not to look at us as a prodigal. He looks at us as a son. He said, Father, I'm not even worthy to be called your son. And he turns around and he says, my son is home. You might be here this morning thinking, I'm not worthy to be called God's anything. I'm not worthy to be called his son or daughter. Some people don't go to church because they don't think they're worthy to attend church. They joke around, you know. Oh, lightning will strike if I walk inside the doors of a church. But I'm here to tell you, God saw him when he was in the arms of his father. God saw him when he was in the pig pit. You don't, don't you think your secret sin is hidden from God? Where can you go that the presence of God cannot find you? If you make your bed in hell, he's there. If you ascend to the hills, he's there. If you climb to the depths of the pit, he's there. You cannot outrun God. And let me tell you something. If you're here and you are not walking with the Lord right now, if your mama or your dad is praying for you, give up now. Amen. Give up. What I want you to take from this story is this simple truth is that you can't clean you. You can't fix you. You just got to come home. You just got to come home. And I don't care what you've been in. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how you smell. I do a little, but you know, you know, you know what I'm saying? I don't care, you know. We're not, we're not looking for perfect skin and nice hair and whatever. We just want you to come home. Just come home. Come home. Just come home to Jesus. Come home today. Just come home because we're going to sing welcome home. We're not, we're not here to ask you, you know, I can, I can see some religious people like that other brother. Where you been anyway? You stank. Go take a shower. Because some, some of the church kind of act like that brother. Well, I never wasted my money. I never lived with no hogs. No, but you're bitter. And you resent the party. The brother should have been the first. The brother should have been out by the smoker. Y'all know what I'm saying? He should have been out there cooking to celebrate that his brother came home. That's who we are. That's why we bought a smoker. Okay. Right? Come home. If you're here today and you are not walking with God, just come home. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come to me. All you are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. As I close today, I want to make this statement. It's time for you to come home. Get up out your mess. Get up out of your mess. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Don't think you have to stop and be free from your addiction to come home to God. Come home to God. He'll take care of the addiction. You, well, Pastor, you know, I, I feel like I'll burst into flames if I walk into church because, you know, I'm bound to this and I'm bound to that and I do this and I do that and, and, and I, got a, I got a vulgar mouth and a perverted mind and I, I'm in this and I'm in that and I'm a liar and a cheater and all, all this other kind of stuff. And God isn't saying, hey, clean up your act and then come to me. He just says, come on. Come home. Just come on. Come on. We're waiting. We're waiting. We're waiting. Me and Zach are in the back by the smoker. Just come on back. Let's go. Come on. Let's do it. Stop thinking that you, you're, you're okay because you're a good person. Because good people are also jacked up people. Messed up people. But they're still good people. Being good isn't going to get you into heaven. Getting saved gets you into heaven. Amen. Amen. Come on. Somebody say that's right. that's right. Get up out of your mess. Just come home. Just as you are. Why? Because daddy is waiting for you to come home. I'll never forget. This will be my last story and then we're going to pray. I'll never forget. 
when my daughter, I forget how old she was. See, the problem with Jillian is she's adventurous. Y'all, how many of you got adventurous children? You know they're a problem. Right? They can be a problem, a problem because they're so adventurous, especially when you put an adventurous kid on a bike. Oh, uh-huh. you mean I can actually get off this street? Hold on, right? So Jillian discovered that when you leave the boundaries that your parents set for you because your parents tried to protect you, you can get scared. Because she just dis- forgot and just said, well, uh-uh. I like riding my bike. Oh, let's see what the city of Toledo has to offer. (laughs) And she, now the funny part is, she was only two streets over. She found herself two blocks from the house. Didn't know how to get home. Panicked. Long story short, she got home. Obviously, she made it. (laughs) But sometimes in our lives, we don't, we, we think so much about being the child that's lost. And some of us don't stop to think about the father. Have you ever, as a child, maybe I'm the only one in here. I'm thinking me and Rocky, probably the only ones in here that have ever done this. But have ever been that adventurous child and maybe squandered, well, squandered a little bit. We went beyond the borders. Just, just, you know, one or two of us, you know. And maybe... You were irresponsible. And do you remember coming home to your parents? And they go from being relieved to angry in about 2.7 seconds. Y'all remember? My 11th grade year, I went to an event called Night of Joy. Night of Joy was at Disney World. And it was back in the day, I'm going to date myself now, DC Talk, Carmen, Stephen Curtis Chapman, Audio adrenaline, I mean, it was cool. And you got access to all the rides at Disney. This is before, never mind, I'm not going to say that. (laughs) Thank you, thank you. You are a good, good father. Uh, So we went, and they knew the last concert was at midnight. And they knew, my parents knew, we lived 15 minutes from Disney. Give or take, because of the traffic, I should be home no later than 1 a.m., so we leave, and a guy in our youth group who was old, he was a volunteer, he was in his 20s, and we play basketball all the time together, and he said, hey, he goes, do you have to go home right now? I'm like, well, I think I probably should. And he goes, I'm hungry. And I'm like, now that you say it, I'm hungry too. He goes, you want to go to Denny's? I said, let's go to Denny's. And we didn't have cell phones, y'all. We, we went to Denny's, and we went to Denny's, and we had, you know, a Grand Slam. Some of y'all don't know what a Grand Slam is. but We got a Denny's in Kingdom City, go discover yourself a Grand Slam. And if you don't like Grand Slam, get a moons over my hammy because I promise you it's good. Anyway, moving on. We go and we just got talking and we got talking about the concerts and the, the whole night. Next thing I know, I looked down at my watch and it was 3 a.m. Relax, I made it. My parents didn't kill me. I get home at 3 a.m. And my mother ran up to me and grabbed me with tears in her eyes. And said, oh, thank you, Jesus. He's okay. And my father walked up to me. (laughs) He goes, you all right? I said, yes, sir. He goes, you sure you're all right? I said, yes, sir. He goes, there's no problems here. I said, no. Boy, if you ever in your life. And how many know he didn't lay a finger on me, but he whooped me. Y'all know what I'm saying? Whoop me with his mouth. He put the fear of God in my life. And do you know, do you know everywhere I went, I kept a quarter in my pocket? Because guess what would happen if there was a delay? I need to find a pay phone. I need to find it right now. So sometimes we don't, we fail to remember that our, that's what parents do is, is when we're not where we're supposed to be, they panic and they fear and they worry and they pray and they stress out. You listening? Good. Um, but I want to close with this statement. I want to take you not to the mind of the father for a second. I'd like to take you into the mind of the son. The son was scared to come home. Thought he would be rejected. Didn't know what was waiting for him. I promise you when I go home at three o'clock in the morning, I did not know what was waiting for me. 
I prayed my parents would be asleep. Just kidding. No. <laughs> no such luck. But he came home to find his father was searching. He was hugged. He was kissed. He was given new robes, a ring, shoes, and a party. And I can see at the end of the night, after he'd gotten showered, cleaned up, his belly's full for the first time, and we don't know how long his belly was full, laying in his bed at night. And I can see him looking up to heaven and saying, wow, he still called me son. He still called me son. And if you're here today, and you have ran away from God, maybe once upon a time you served him, but you've gone the other direction now. If you'll come home, not only is the Father waiting for you, but he will still call you son. Somebody give God praise. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I'm going to ask everybody to stand to your feet. Hallelujah. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you. Lord, I just thank you for the presence of God I feel in this room. Thank you, God. And I pray, Lord, you would use something that was said to get the hearts of men and women today to understand that you are our Father and you are waiting for us to just come home. As the body of Christ, we are singing today, welcome home. We celebrate you. Welcome home. Come home. There's a ring for you. There's a robe for you. There's a party waiting to be held in your honor. Come home in Jesus' name. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to ask you today, if you are here today, and you would say, Pastor Tim, man, you are, you are all up in my business today. You are preaching about me today. And I've not been where I'm supposed to be with God I'm not living for him. I, I don't go to church. I don't read my Bible. I don't pray. I'm not living right. And I want to come home today. I want to come home today. And I, I can feel that there's a spiritual family in this church that will welcome me. But I also feel like God is just waiting on me to come home. You can come home and it doesn't cost you anything but your repentance. It's a simple prayer. And if that's you today, I want to ask you in just a moment to meet me in the front of this church and let me pray for you. Let me lead you back to daddy. He's waiting, he's looking, he's anticipating, and he's ready for you to come home with nobody looking around, not wanting to embarrass anyone. In a moment, I'm going to count to three. And when I say three, I just want you to raise your right hand and say, Pastor Tim, that's me. Please pray for me today. Help me find my way home. If that's you, just lift up your hand. One, two, three. Do it now all over this place. All over this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Let's do this together. Everybody reach over and grab a hand of the person standing next to you. Just take their hand. With nobody looking around, we don't want to embarrass anyone, but I believe God is arresting this moment to restore relationships right now. I'm going to ask you again, if there's anybody here that would say, Pastor Tim, I'm ready to come home. Please pray for me. I just want you to squeeze the hand of the one you're holding. And if they squeeze your hand, just say, come on, I'll go with you. And bring them here and let's pray together. Let's pray together. Let's pray together. If that's you, squeeze that hand right now. If they squeeze your hand, you bring them. Let's pray together in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Is there anybody here? One, thank you. Anybody else? Is there anybody here? You're ready to come home. You're ready to come home. Hallelujah. Kimberly, will you come and minister to her, please? Thank you, Lord. Amen. Everybody looking this way, I want to encourage you with something today. Maybe, maybe 